Everybody lift both hands up as high as you can get them. You say this with me out loud, Lord Jesus. I'm so glad I'm not in hell. I'm so glad you reached down and saved me. And you have set me free by the power of God. I give you all the praise and all the glory for what you have done in my life and watch what you're going to do. Let not one little boy or one little girl leave this building without knowing Jesus Christ has changed their life. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Amen and amen. Well, I'll give the Lord one more clap off of you. Did you hear about this little boy in class that wrote this little paper and the teacher said, now you write this paper on anything you want to. So they called on his name, little Johnny stood up and the teacher said, I'm going to, I'm going to write my paper and read it on there is a God. So he read a few moments and the teacher interrupted him and said, Johnny, she said, I hate to tell you this, but I'm going to have to give you an F for that paper. Because, Johnny, there is no God. He said, Johnny, can you uh, see God? And Johnny said, no. Teacher said, then there is no God. Sit down, I'm giving you an F. Little girl sitting next to him, her name was Mary. Mary said, teacher, can I ask Johnny something about that? And she said, okay, Mary, go ahead, ask Johnny. So Mary says to Johnny, says, Johnny, can you see the teacher? Johnny said, yes. Can you see the teacher's brain? And Johnny said, no. And Mary said, well, based on what she just told you, that must mean she has no brain. (laughs) Turn with me in your Bibles this morning, if you will, please. He's a great God, isn't he? Second Samuel chapter 9, if you will, and just stay there and I'll be there in a minute. I want you to travel with me for a few moments back some 3,000 years to the days of ancient dynasties and the great kings of Israel. It's a brutal era, particularly for all of the former monarchs when they would lose the throne and a new king would take over because it was customary that the brutality that would take place when there would be a transfer of power, the present kings would always exterminate every member of the former king's family. I'm thinking particularly at this moment of King Saul and his son Jonathan. They rode into battle and both of them were killed. David is now appointed and anointed as the great king of Israel. In the course of this transfer of power, when word had reached all of the people that were in the family of Saul, all the family of Saul began to scatter and they would run and they would flee in terror because they knew what would take place, that all of the former members of Saul's family would be mutilated and murdered and killed, they were for certain by King David. It is at this place that I want to read to you from the Word of God, 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4. Now in the midst of all of this, rather than me read it, let me just paraphrase what took place. One of the King Saul's nurses that would care for King Saul's grandson, 
took that child and when they fled, thinking that they were going to be murdered, they picked up this little boy and he was only five years old and scripture says that they began to flee for their life now that David was king. But something happened. The nurse fell. And this little boy's feet were crushed. Crushed so brutally that he would forever, for the rest of his life, be a cripple. And it is at this moment, in their haste to escape, that this little boy is permanently and forever handicapped. It is now going to be he is only five years of age. We leave him on the pages of the ancient record and his name is Mephibosheth. Turn to your neighbor and look in their eyes and say to them, his name is Mephibosheth. Say, I will never forget Mephibosheth. <laughs> Mephibosheth, it's now 20 years later. He is now an adult. The story continues. He's living off in another place and he's living his life and he lives in anonymity because the last thing Mephibosheth wants anybody to know is to know that he is the grandson of the late King Saul. So he's carrying on with his life. At that same 20 year period later, King David has not only taken the throne, but he has won the hearts of the people. With his now incredible record, King David is a man that is now a man that is praised and applauded because he is a great king. There is no blemish on his record. He is a man that has taken the throne and he has expanded his kingdom not only from 6,000 square miles, but he now has expanded the mighty kingdom of Israel to over 60,000 square miles. He is respected. He is feared. He has an army like no one had ever seen in that ancient world. And King David is a man that has brought to his people peace and prosperity. And he is grateful to the Almighty God for what God has done in his life since he took the throne 20 years prior. Now in that moment of thanksgiving, David gets up one day and he's thinking about all of the good things that God has done. Pastor, I am a witness to your work of the last 14, 13 years. I am a witness that I can say, not from somebody that's been here in every service, but for somebody that comes in periodically and has the privilege of gracing this pulpit where he has labored and he has toiled and he has sweat and he has shed tears and to see this great work that has been carved out. But sometimes I think in the midst of all of it for all of us, how often do we just stop for a minute and take a breath and sit down and reflect and think about how good How good God has been. Give me a minute. I got to get myself together. I'm just so happy to be here. I was talking to my wife last night. She wanted, you know what? Y'all are going to have, him have me back more often now because I'm getting older. And I could go home any minute. You need to get me back here more often. So start picketing around here. Get some signs, picket, and say, we won't Dwight. So 
I was thinking about, I was talking to Zonel last night. She wanted so much my wife to be here. And we have a friend that is taken unbelievably, horribly ill. She felt so much this dear friend of ours for many, many years. Zonel said, I just have to stay here with her and if I can get loose, I'll come in. I said, she said, when are you coming home? I said, well, I'm preaching Sunday morning, but I'm staying there Sunday night because my favorite preacher is going to preach. Then I'm going to have to stay at least until Wednesday night because he's going to preach on Wednesday night. So I got to stay here at least till Wednesday night. So after this morning, I get to sit here tonight and tomorrow night and next night and then Wednesday night while he's up here preaching again. I'm going to throw my boot at him right while he's preaching. Right up here. <laughs> but I keep thinking about, Pastor, how many times in this, in this quest, in this in this unbelievable emotion that we get wrapped up in and calling it the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ that I've had the privilege of doing for almost, I know you don't believe it, I don't look that old, but it's true, I started when I was three. But I mean that for nearly 40 years that I've been preaching the gospel, I just wanna stop and say for a moment, thank you, Lord, for how wonderful you have been to me. Thank you for giving me the privilege that I have preached literally around the world. Thank you that I have, I have seen the benefits and the privileges of being a child of God. And I stand up here this morning not bragging about anything except only one thing. Not that devils are subject unto us. Not that we speak in tongues. Not that we can tread upon serpents. Not that we can drink poison. The Bible said it won't hurt you. But I glory in only one thing this morning and one thing alone that I'm a sinner saved by the grace of God and therein is where my glory is because I am grateful I have failed him but he has never failed me does anyone feel that way thank him for it right now So David, in this moment of reflection, and in this moment of thanksgiving, and he looks at his kingdom, he looks for what God has done in 20 years, and he's thankful. Thankful. And he stops, and he remembers something. He remembers those early days in his life and he thinks about what God has done in this 20 year span and all of a sudden in this moment of gratitude there is a spirit of grace. Now if you don't need to hear my message this morning on grace, you might as well leave because I've given my message a title. It's called A Chariot Called Grace. <laughs> Blessed be the man that understands grace. Don't be too hard on everybody around you. Had it not been for the grace of God, there you would go. Don't be too hard on the man that's still struggling in the church that can't get it all together because had it not been for the grace of God, there you are. Don't be too swift to criticize that man that may be hidden in this auditorium because the word of God told me and the Holy Ghost told me, Pastor, there's gonna be preachers from all over America that's gonna be hiding because they've been living in a place to where the devil's tried to kill them. But I'm here to tell you, they're gonna be lifted by the grace and the power of God and they're going to be restored to the kingdom of God. Grace. So in this moment, David says this. But this is the way I see this. So I feel this when I say it. David, in this moment, this nostalgic moment, this moment when he's grateful, grace drips from his lips in this utterance, he says, 2 Samuel 9, verse 1, he says, Is there anyone left in the house of Saul, 
my enemy, that I may show kindness for the sake of my covenant friend called Jonathan. These are the words of a man that's on top. But yet on top, he remembers how good God has been to him. The biggest problem big time preachers are gonna have to deal with is to not feel like a big shot. Because the moment you feel like a big shot is when you're gonna turn out to be buckshot. I submit to you that we're safer at his feet than ever trying to climb upon his throne. And may God help we preachers to stay humble before the Lord. Now, he doesn't stop there. He doesn't say, is there anyone left who is deserving? Is there anyone left who is sharp and qualified and could benefit my... <laughs> is there anyone that is handsome that would represent me well in the kingdom or anyone that is beautiful trim and gorgeous doesn't say that he's reaching as far as he can reach not among the host of people he deems to be his friends but he's reaching into the heart of the very bloodline of the one that wanted him dead. He said, is there anybody left in the house of my enemy? Huh? Don't make me come back, I'll come again. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, huh? Anyone left? A grateful man isn't out looking for somebody he can put down. A grateful man drips with grace. Grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all my sin. Grace. Well, he had a servant, and this servant that worked now for King David once was in the administration of King Saul. So he couldn't get this out of his mind. He kept saying, is there anybody in the house of my enemy that has tried to kill me more than once? This King Saul was one hateful man, and he tried to kill David. It made him furious when the people would sing through the streets of the city and they would say, they would say, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his tens of thousands. And jealousy erupted within the mind and the heart and the soul of this man called Saul that he was possessed with hate and rage. And he tried to kill him, but now Saul's dead. David's taken over. It's 20 years later. Everything's great. This man's in the grave, but David did not forget the covenant that he made with his friend, Jonathan. Ziba. Everybody say Ziba. So Ziba comes. And David says to him, he said, is there anybody left in the house of Saul that I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now watch this. 
Ziba said, well, there's one. And then he was quick to say, he is a cripple. He is a grandson of King Saul and he is the son of Jonathan. But you must remember, you could almost see the no on Ziba's face, but you must remember he's handicapped, he's crippled, and, 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 and that's who is left. Did you ever get around people that just have a, a no face? They'll do anything that they can to deprive grace for some that need it the most. The rejects and the outcasts, we don't want them in our churches. I remember the day, Pastor, I used to preach that some of the pastors I would preach for, they didn't want that hippie crowd in the 60s to come into the church, but I'm here to tell you, I submit to you that if Jesus landed in Columbus, Ohio, he wouldn't stop here first. He would say, take me to the ghettos, take me to the junkies, take me to the abortion houses. I want to go where people are hurt. Grace! Somebody shout grace! Somebody get on your feet and say grace! Clap your hands and thank him for grace. Grace! Now if that wasn't bad enough, David said, David said to Ziba, said, well, I want him. I want to go get him. And he says, where is he? And Ziba said, well, that's another point. He's not only handicapped, he's not only a cripple, and he's not only the grandson of your greatest enemy. You better keep an eye on him. But he lives in a region that's called Wasteland. He lives in a place that is translated barren. He lives in anonymity because he didn't want anybody to know who he was, know where he came from. He lives in a place called Lodibar. And loaded bar means waste. It's not, the, it's not the end of the world, but it's the place where you can see the end of the world. And he is waning and wasting in a place, his life away in a place called loaded bar. Well, I got good news for all of you that still stuck in Lodabar. There's about to be a commission from the throne of heaven and there is going to be dispatched to your Lodabar on the other side of the tracks where you're wasting away and people have said no hope. Get ready. The king is about to send the chariot of grace to Lodabar. Somebody shout hallelujah. Excuse me, I'm just a grateful man. Somebody get up and hug somebody and say grace. You ask me why I'm happy, I'm gonna tell you why. 
because my sins are gone. They're in the sea of God's forgetfulness. Praise God, that's good enough for me. Mister, there ain't no need to tell me what I've done. It's too late. I already know who I am. The chariot of grace came to Lodabar and took me out. I gotta shout for just a minute. Somebody shout with me. He didn't ask it once. He didn't ask it twice. He asked it three times. Is there anybody left in the house of my enemy? There's always a zebra around. There's always gonna be somebody around that wants you to stay in Lodabar. There's always gonna be somebody around that says, you're no good, you're no good. Baby, you're no good. There's always gonna be somebody that's gonna say, you're never gonna turn out right. You're gonna turn out just like that daddy. You never do anything right. You're no good. You're weak, you're ugly, you're mean, you're hateful. You're a sinner, but I got news for you. The chariot is coming to your house. My God, coming to your house. This is really what the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me about. There's going to be preachers that once had thriving, powerful ministries that stuck off in Lodabar. And they've been trying to get out of that place. The people around don't want them to get out of that place. Heard a preacher one time, wouldn't even begin to dare call his name or get close to it. Interviewed him on television one time. I'd had him on there two or three times before and each time he came on television, he'd say this. He said, well, I made such and such a mistake and we discussed it this way that last time and then we discussed my mistake another way the time before that and then his wife was with him and said, we thought this time we had discussed my sin from my wife's point of view. Never forget that. Great big church he pastored. And I looked at him and I said it as kindly and yet as firmly as I know how. I said, how many years ago did that happen? He said, seven. I said, well, let me tell you something. That's enough. I ain't interested in your sin. I'm not interested in what you did. I'm not interested in that hell hole you came out of. I'm not interested in your failure. I'm not interested in your mistake. I don't want your wife's point of view. I'm not interested in what you've done. I'm interested in where you're going. Oh, listen to me. Listen to me. Don't let anybody keep you in Lodabar. This is gonna be life-changing camp meeting for a lot of people. You know why? Gonna be a lot of Lodabar residents that dyed their hair and changed their name and they're gonna sneak in here behind sunglasses 
but the king is sending the chariot of grace to their Lodabar. been a f- two or three years since I've been here, so y- you're going to get it. <laughs> I mean, I'm just one little happy camper. You're going to get it. And so here's Mephibosheth. He's toiling away. He load a bar. Low. Everybody say low. Low down. Low down in Lodabar. That's a good name, isn't it? I just love that. Low, everybody say Lodabar. I don't like that Lodabar. That's where you were. That's where Willie was the first time I preached here, wasn't it, Patrick? He was in that load of bar of booze. Man, he is always drinking white rabbit to hop around or old crow to fly a little bit. <laughs> but I want to tell you something. On that day a number of years ago in that farmer building, sitting on the second seat, he heard that little simple preacher up there stumbling around trying to talk about enough is enough. And William stood up and raised that hand and in that little voice of his said enough is enough. And about that time the chariot of grace showed up at William's doorstep and he said, Willie, get in. I'm gonna take you to the king. Oh, glory to God. Now imagine Imagine you're, you're slaving away, hiding out in Lodabar. You look like you've been to Lodabar in your life. How many knows what Lodabar means? All the rest of you lift your hands up. I'm going to cast that lying devil out of you right now. You've been low in Lodabar. David said he gave the order. Send my chariot to Lodibar and bring back to me that reject, that outcast, that man that is living in anonymity, that man that doesn't want anybody to know that his grandfather was the wicked king Saul. Go get him and bring him back to me. And he looks out his window and there pulls up in front of his Lodabor shack a chariot called Grace. They came to him and they said, we have come to you from the king that says you're to come with us because the king wants to see you. You might think the first thing Mephibosheth said, 20 years I've been hiding out in this wasteland. 20 years I've been waning away. 20 years I've been eating dust in this place where not even a crop of any kind can grow. And now they found me. They know that I'm of the bloodline of King Saul. They found me. They found me. They found me and fear gripped his heart. That's the impression too many people have of God. That's the impression too many people have of God. He's a mean God with a big ball bat and he can't wait to bash everybody's sinful brains out. 
But I want to tell you what God sees more than you. He sees his son, Jesus. He sees a Jonathan that he has covenant with. And he's coming to you not on the behalf of you, but he's coming to you on the behalf of Jonathan or Jesus. And here's little Mephibosheth with those crutches making his way to that, knowing that he'll, he's got a child now. He's a young man. Be the last time I see any of you, most likely he's thinking. And he gets inside that chariot. And he sits down and that golden door is slammed shut. And I'm sure he imagines he sees bars all over the window. And he feels and hears the crack of that whip that's gonna hit on the back of those royal steeds that have come to bring him to the king. And now then he is blazing through the wasteland of Lodabar, back across the land into the gates of Jerusalem and right up in front of the king's palace. And the door is open. And here comes Mephibosheth, hobbling along on his little crutches. And they bring him in where the giant doors must be several stories high and they open and you could hear the clump, clump, clump of the little crutches banging against that marble golden floor until finally he's standing in front of the king, King David. And it so terrifies him, the Bible says, he falls prostrate, trembling in fear. Get this. David said, one word, David said, Mephibosheth. I'm sure Mephibosheth was trying to hear the tone of how he said it. And Mephibosheth answered, your servant, I'm your servant. And no doubt he could see that helpless, broken little piece of humanity that has unfortunately been handicapped in that horrific accident, trembling on the floor in front of the king that has the power to speak the word and exterminate him like a roach. People don't preach this too much. But the number one phrase Jesus used more than he has any other phrase in Holy Scripture. Jesus used it more than any other phrase. It only has two words and it's this. Fear not. Fear not. I haven't come to condemn you. I haven't come to squash you. But I've come to save you. Where sin abounds, his grace abounds. He said, fear not. Then David said, I have come and brought you here to show you loving kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. It has nothing to do with your grandfather. Listen to this word. Listen to what I'm about to say. Grab this. The generational curse was broken. It stopped with Jonathan. It was cut off at Saul. But the covenant with Jonathan, many people that want to spend too much time on generational curses better hear this. The very moment that God came to you, he didn't come in judgment, but he sent his son, Jesus. And the moment you come to Jesus, the curse of your past is gone. My God, somebody shout, it's gone.
do not fear. He said, he said, all that your grandfather owned, <laughs> everything your evil grandfather, King Saul, owned, I'm giving it every bit of it to you. The land you lost because of his sin, I now give it back to you. Watch this. Mephibosheth still couldn't get it, so he has to make another point. He says, I, O oh king, your mistake, I'm nothing but a dead dog. He was once more trying to believe his ears because a dead dog that lives in Lodabar is about the most contemptuous piece of human garbage that his language knew how to be descriptive. I'm just a dirty dead dog living in Lodabar. I'm not worth anything to you. But David, like God, said, you forget, I made a covenant with your father named Jonathan. <laughs> And just like God made a covenant with his son, Jesus Christ, that everyone that comes to Jesus, their sins are erased, and that that they've lost is replaced, and everything the devil has taken from you, he said, I'm not only gonna save you and take you to heaven, but I'm gonna give you back everything that the devil has lost. He said, get up on your feet. And he stood up and he turned to that Zeba. And he said, Zeba, he said, now, the order is given, be sure it's carried out. Everything that his grandfather owned, it is now his. It's not all. And he will eat at my table. <laughs> There's more. He said, not only that, you, Zeba, since you were the, in the administration of Saul, you will administrate the care of his property. You, your sons, which were 15, you, your servants, which he had 20, will not only hand the land over to him, but you're going to cultivate it. You're going to plow it. You're going to sow it. You're going to water it. You're going to take care of it. You're going to keep the birds away, and then you're going to bring it in and put it in his storehouse. But Zeba, listen to me. He's going to eat at my table. He didn't say it once, twice, three times. He said it four times. He's going to eat at my table. So I close with this. Here it is. That's what he wants to do for you. He ain't mad at you. We may get on this platform and scream judgment into your face. But I'm going to tell you something you don't know. He loves you. He's not mad at you. And the choice is yours. If you want to be free, you can be free. Judgment may scare the hell out of you, but only grace will take you to heaven. That's it. Just grace. Watch this. Zeba, 15 sons, 20 servants, working in the field. But come dinner time, I just can't wait till pastor preaches this, because he's gonna preach it like it ought to be preached. When the dinner bell at the king's royal banquet table rings, watch this, the royal dining hall in walks 
the king and he sits at the end of the table. In walks Amnon, clever, crafty, devious. He sits next to the king. In walks the beautiful, irrepressible, indescribably beautiful, another way, drop dead gorgeous, <laughs> Tamar. She comes in and sits next to Amnon. In walks from across the library hall, precocious, brilliant, stately, studious, Solomon, the next heir apparent to the throne, and he sits at the table. In walks Absalom, hair as black as a raven, long, arrogant, two-faced, but he walks in at the dinner table and he sits down. And in walks Joab, the great commander-in-chief of the mightiest army in all of the ancient world. He's the commander of the armies of the king of Israel. And he sits down. But there's one more. Clump, 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 clump. That's what happens when grace comes to your house. Clump. It don't matter if you're a reject. Don't matter if you're an outcast. Don't matter if you've lived in Lobadar for 35 years. When the king sends the chariot of grace, it's coming to your house and it's going to take you to the king's table. And here comes Mephibosheth, crutches, club-footed, making his way to the table. And he sits down at the table. Watch this. And the cloth, the tablecloth of God's grace covers his triple feet and that's what happens when you become a child of God the load of bar of sin is covered by the tablecloth of God's grace get on your feet grace grace Grace, grace, grace. My God, for the next 60 seconds, shout for grace. Now look at this preacher all over this room. No one moving, no heads bowed, no eyes closed. I haven't come just to preach a sermon. I came with this in my heart. God gave me while I was en route on that airplane to get here. The chariot of grace pulled up in front of your house. I want to say it a third time. There's going to be preachers in this count meeting, Pastor Parsley, that are at the end of their road. And God's grace is going to restore them and heal them. There's backsliders that's here this morning. God's grace has pulled up to your house. There's people sitting in this room this morning that you've never committed, but God's grace has pulled up. Now listen to this preacher and listen closely. When you take Jesus, you get it all. Listen. That famous art dealer in the 40s was known throughout the world. 
that had the most incredible art collection in the history of the world in the 40s. He had a son that worked with him closely. They were not only in business together, they were devoted to each other. The son went off to war and he was killed in battle. The father grieved. He contemplated closing up this incredible over 300 pieces of priceless art, but he forged ahead. About that time later, a knock came on the door. <clears throat> he opened the door and there stood a young soldier that had come home from the war. He handed a letter and in the letter was a note that says, Father, this is my friend John. Would you admit him? He has something to say. He came in and sat down and the young soldier said, I knew your son. He saved my life. He gave his life that I could be free. He saved it. We were in a foxhole one night and I had a piece of canvas and I began to pencil out a pencil drawing of your son and I brought it to give it to you. This is the last time I saw him. The father took the painting of the drawing of that son and he began to weep. He held it and looked at it. He hugged the young soldier. He said, thank you. And he had the drawing framed and put it over the mantle of his fireplace to where he could see it. Shortly thereafter, he died. And over a thousand art collectors from around the world came to New York. And the auctioneer opened it up and said, now we begin the auction. And the first thing we will auction off is going to be this pencil drawing. And he pulled the cloth back and there was the pencil drawing of that man's son. Somebody stood up and said, that's junk. We don't want that. We're not interested in that. Bring out the good stuff. I've come from Europe. I've come from here. I've come from there. And they all begin to complain. But the rules were we got to sell this one first. About that time, the young soldier boy was in the back. He stood up and he said, I have $20 and that's all I've got and I'll give that to get that painting back. Finally, somebody stood up and said, give it to him, we're not gonna bid. And about that time, the auctioneer said, all right, $20 once, $20 twice, $20 third and last call, sold to the soldier for $20. He shut the book. The auctioneer announced that concludes the auction. People stood up and said, what do you mean? He said, the last will and testament of the Father was this. Whoever takes the Son gets it all. Somebody shout yes! The chariot of grace is on your doorstep. In a suburb, in a ghetto called Lodabar. Every man, woman, boy and girl in this building that said, Dwight Thompson, there's something in my life. I need forgiveness and I accept his grace. Without one split's hesitation, every man every woman every boy every girl that says dwight thompson i'm not playing games but i'm not going to turn down this offer of grace i need his forgiveness if you want this prayer that i know beyond the shadow of a doubt will change your life when i count to three raise your right hand up as high as you can get it and hold it there you say dwight what will people think it doesn't matter what people think it matters what God thinks. Brother Dwight, I've got something in my life. I'm not where I used to be. I'm not where I want to be. I've got something in there, and I want his forgiveness. When I count to three all over this building, hands are already going up. But on three, if you want this prayer, that you know his grace will wash your sins away, raise your hand right now. One, two, three. Raise it up all over this building. Don't take it down. Don't take it down. There are possibly a hundreds of hands that are raised all across this room. Oh, 
Leave it up, don't take it down. I believe that I can conservatively say there's probably 500 hands that are up. I want now everybody in this building to lift both hands with them and pray this prayer out loud. Say this with me out loud. Lord Jesus, thank you for grace. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for washing my sins away. I repent. I confess you as Savior and Lord. I believe you're the Christ, the Son of God. Thank you, Lord, for your grace that has washed my sins away.